Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning to you all uh, on a windy and uh, kind of dreary morning. What an appropriate day to be talking about <laughs> civil rights. Um, this lecture is on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose contribution to the civil rights movement, specifically the Birmingham campaign of 1963. How many of you are taking English Composition II right now? Is anybody here taking that? Yeah, great. Are you all studying Dr. King? Great. You reading a letter from Birmingham Jail? Then you're in the right place. And even if you're not, you're most welcome here. Um, we're also going to hopefully have about five, ten minutes at the end of class for a question and answer period, but this is kind of going to be a traditional lecture, and I'm, I'm afraid occasionally it'll be a little bit of word vomit, okay? But please, take notes, write down questions. Uh, I, I speak pretty quickly, but I will be happy to slow down at your request. Um, also, I'd like to welcome students and friends who are watching on Facebook Live. Where's the camera? Hi. Uh, so we have some online students watching today, and I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, please feel free to comment on the uh, on the Facebook comments page there with questions and anything else you want to tell me. You know, if you want to tell me that I just suck as a lecturer, okay, that's fine. You can comment on that. But uh, uh, anyway, at least some of you are earning extra credit for attending today. And in order to do that, you actually have to put a comment on there, right, so that we can know you're here. So uh, you guys are most welcome here as well. All right, shall we? Does anybody have? Yeah, here we go. How about, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Babcock. All right, you know what? I'm already tired of this jacket. It's going away. Let me begin by saying that civil rights did not begin or end with Martin Luther King. If, if you think civil rights is only about Dr. King, it's not, not even close. There have been a number of freedom movements in this country Number of civil rights movements. Yeah, please, Neurali, come up here with me. One of the first being the, the uh, movement to abolish slavery. Come over here. It's okay. Sit right here. Come over here. <laughs> You're most welcome here. Please sit down. One of the first uh, movements in this country, civil rights movements, was the uh, movement to abolish slavery. And one prominent figure in that struggle was Frederick Douglass. Let me move this for you. Sorry. I don't even really know how to move that, so go ahead. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> Squeeze by. <bio. laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Hey, thanks. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. All right. We all good? No. There's Frederick Douglass. He penned the uh, most compelling, in my view, slave narrative of the 19th century, and himself was a former minister, uh, activist, and political figure, as well as an author, which were roles that would foreshadow the roles of Dr. King would play. Douglas was also an inspiration to Langston Hughes. The Harlem Renaissance poet, who my friend W. Jason Miller has recently demonstrated, gave Martin King poems and really influenced and inspired his rhetoric. My point is that Dr. King did not invent civil rights. There's a long lineage of Americans, black and white, who in the words of Hughes in his poem Honoring Douglas, decided to be bold. They captured every street on which they set their feet to route each path toward freedom's goal, to make each highway choose their compass's choice. Hughes ended this poem with a paradox. He said, Douglas died in 1895. He is not dead. Now this particular movement, which we're going to be looking at today in the American Symphony, if you will, did not begin with Dr. King, nor was it controlled by or even often centered on him. And King admitted as much. In fact, King mainly attributed the movement successes in the 50s and 60s, not to himself, but to high school and college students. Well, certainly there were other people involved. He tells a story of an elderly woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who joined the famous bus boycott there in 1955 and who, when asked why she was involved in the struggle, she said, I'm doing it for my children and for my grandchildren. Some of those grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren, are in this room today. Likely, this was the same woman whom King quotes in the letter from Birmingham Jail. Her name was Mother Pollard. And Pollard, when asked why she participated in the movement, he said that she replied with ungrammatical profundity. She said, my feet is tired, but my soul is at rest. But nonetheless, it was the children. King says in his book, somewhere here, 
is why we can't wait about the Birmingham campaign. It was the children who understood the stakes that they were fighting for the most. And he tells one really profound story of a teenage boy whose father's devotion to the movement turns sour. In other words, the father was on board with civil rights until he learned that his son had pledged to become a demonstrator. And he forbade him from participating, but the son replied, Daddy, I don't want to disobey you, but I've already made this pledge. So if you tell me not to go, I'm going to sneak off. If you try to keep me home, I'm just going to have to be punished for it because I'm not just doing this for me. I'm doing it for you and for mama. And I want this to come before you die. King concludes that story by saying the father thought it over and decided instead to give his son his blessing. But lest you think it was an easy choice for a father to give his children the keys. You must remember that several protesters and civilians were murdered during this period, ranging from young, committed, nonviolent soldiers of the movement to elderly women and children who were either caught up in the racist, violent reprisals uh, from police officers and uh, extra legal vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Beyond that, protesters were often beaten, humiliated excluded from civil society, thrown into rotten, disgusting jail cells for weeks or months at a time. That man right there, actually both of these men, but that man right there is still alive. He's an American hero. His name is John Lewis. He's a congressman from Atlanta. But why were students, young people, the ones who brought our nation back, as King says, to the great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers? Why students? Well, partly, King says, it's because they were following the example of protesters from earlier periods, like the Montgomery bus boycott seven years earlier. But I also think it's because young people felt they had little to lose. I mean, listen, I'm an old man. I have a mortgage. I have a career. Uh, I have a, a car payment. I have children. I have so much to lose. But then again, I have freedom. And they didn't. King says the movement was blessed by the fire and excitement of young people with nothing to lose and everything to lose. Now, even though there were hundreds of other civil rights heroes from this time, I wish to spend most of our time today in Birmingham, for it was these eight days in the Birmingham City Jail that really changed not only the, the, the course of our nation's history, but also King's life. It was here that he penned his classic manifesto, Letter from Birmingham Jail, which we're studying in this class, and uh, we'll also be actually looking at a selection from Why We Can't Wait, talking about his decision to go to jail in this lecture. And then I'll end very briefly with an overview of what happened to King after Birmingham. Let me start by saying this. The Civil Rights Movement must begin, in the 1950s and 60s, we must begin with Brown versus Board of Topeka, Kansas, uh, sorry, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, the most important Supreme Court decision ever handed down, and the greatest victory that the NAACP ever won. Uh, this victory, this decision, was uh, actually striking down a previous Supreme Court ruling in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, which argued that you could have constitutionally segregation. Hey guys, come in. Y'all could have codified racial segregation. It was fine as long as equal accommodations and equal money was devoted to black and white, whether it was schools or other uh, government agencies that were funding and supporting black people and white people. It could, it's fine as long as it was equal. You could separate people. In the North, in northern communities and states, segregation was there, but it was mainly implied. It was about neighborhoods where blacks and whites had to live in separate neighborhoods, or it was in the types of jobs that were afforded to people. But in the South, Segregation was codified. It was legalized. It was written down, going all the way from state laws to local ordinances. Look at how nearly every facet of public life, private life, is covered in this list. And this isn't even exhaustive. Segregation of voting booths, restaurants, um, uh, lunch counters. These are the ones that you probably learned about in elementary school, right, when you're studying Dr. King. But look at how it also tainted marriage laws medical care, even the minutia of everyday life, telephone booths, libraries, prisons, uh, amusement parks. King tells a famous story in Letter from Birmingham Jail about having to tell his daughter she can't go to an amusement park. Fun town. 
in Atlanta because it was prohibited to her. Uh, zoos, department stores, that was actually the instigator for the Birmingham campaign. Um, even, <laughs> my favorite one, I'm gonna pick on Dr. Rujo for a second, circus ticket booths. In Louisiana, there was a law that said that circus ticket booths had to be segregated and they had to be kept at least 25 feet apart. Who the hell wrote that law? Who thought, boy, you know what? We really need to get this down in the law to make sure that we don't have those circus ticket booths integrated because God knows what would happen then. It's amazing to consider how minutia and all of this legal under the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson ruling. By the way, that offensive sign is out of the Lone Star, Lone Star Restaurant Association of Dallas, Texas. It wasn't just Alabama. It was here in Odessa. It was here in Midland. But in 1954, the court ruled that separate but equal was inherently contradictory to the 14th Amendment when it came to education. It started in schools. And that decision, which is still, we are dealing with ramifications of today in our schools, in our communities, in this university, it reignited a moribund civil rights movement. It put a fire under people and gave African Americans in this country hope that they hadn't had for a while, that someday segregation, racism, the dehumanization of people based on who they are, that that would become a relic. But as often happens in the civil rights movement, it's amazing the roller coaster ride that people go on. Tragedy immediately follows great victory. One such tragedy was in 1955. A 14-year-old boy named Emmett Till from Chicago was visiting his relatives down in a village called Money, Mississippi. Anybody ever been there? Money, Mississippi, small little town. Nobody knows how this incident really began. He went to a grocery store, and there he met a white woman. Some say that he wolf-whistled at her. Some say that she flirted with him and he flirted back. Some say nothing happened at all. In fact, last year in Time Magazine, the woman reported that she had made it all up. But what we do know happened is apparent, clear. Her husband and his uh, half-brother they kidnapped Emmett Till, and they took him out in the woods. They wrapped barbed wire around his neck, and they gouged out his eye. They pistol whipped him and threatened to kill him if he didn't stop talking to white women. Till replied, talk to white women? I'm going to talk to him again. You can't stop me. The husband, who later on admitted this in a magazine, because at that point he had been acquitted of the crime, and so double jeopardy, right? He could go ahead and just say what actually happened. He said that that statement put him over the edge. He said, quote, Chicago boy, I'm tired of him. I'm tired of him sending you kind down here to stir up trouble. God damn you, I'm going to make sure I make an example out of you just so that everybody knows how me and my kind and my folks stand. So they wrapped a 70-pound cotton gin fan around his neck. They shot Emmett Till, and they threw his body in the Tallahatchie River. Till's mother demanded an open casket funeral, and she invited the newspapers to come. Turn away if you're squeamish, please. But out of respect for her wishes, she wanted us to see his body. Emmett Till died in August 1955. Rosa Parks went to jail that December. Just like that. I don't have time to tell you about her heroic stand. I do want to remind you, I hope it's a reminder, that she was no ordinary citizen. She was actually the local uh, NAACP uh, secretary. She was neither the first woman that was arrested for not moving to the back of the bus when a white person stepped on. Um, the first person even in Montgomery. There have been others before her. She claimed she didn't want to be a hero or a symbol for protest. Um, she simply said, my feet hurt. At the end of a long day of work, I didn't want to move because my feet hurt. She said she wasn't a hero. She is a hero, nevertheless. And the newly formed Montgomery Improvement Association seized the opportunity to publicize her refusal and to start up a movement. By the way, how would you like to be this guy? How would you like to be his great-grandson? I often wonder about that. Anyway, they came to a point where they realized they needed a leader, and who was going to lead this nascent protest movement? Well, they chose a 27-year-old man 
handsome, charismatic, newly minted with a PhD from Boston University. His father, grandfather, both pastors uh, in Atlanta. They chose Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to be their leader. And for the next year, King made speeches, organized rallies, and he ferried people to and from work in a carpool system. You know, back then, if you decide not to ride the bus, you gotta get to work somehow. And so they need to walk, or they'd pack into Dr. King's car. He's one of the few African Americans in the community who had a car. That tells you something, by the way, about Dr. King, about his background. He was middle class. Anyway, takes him around town. They do this for a year, and the city starts losing all sorts of money as a result of not getting the bus fares, but really they were suffering embarrassment. They couldn't keep their race problem under control, and so they took King and the other leaders to court, and they had him arrested. The African-American community in Montgomery rallied behind Dr. King and the leaders, and when he comes out of the courtroom after being convicted... He's met by a festive and cheering crowd of uh, black Montgomerians. And his wife, Coretta, a valiant civil rights activist herself, <laughs> gave him a big smooch on the cheek, which for me, I mean, that, yeah, that's my man, right? And he later on said it was one of the happiest moments of his life. The guy's just been convicted of a crime. But only thanks to a court order which declared Alabama's bus segregation laws unconstitutional did he escape an extended stay in jail. The courts often saved Dr. King, and this would be actually one of the first of many segregation statutes that would fall, thanks to the pressure of nonviolent, catch this, direct action, active. And on so December 21st, 1956, <laughs> sitting alongside a white Texan, Glenn Smiley, who grew up about 70 miles east of here in Lorraine, Texas, Glenn Smiley sits down, a white man, next to Martin Luther King, a black man, on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, early in the morning. That evening, with his wife Coretta and daughter, baby daughter Yolanda inside, King woke to the sound of a shotgun blast smashing through his window. Wouldn't be the last time his home was attacked. I'll show you pictures of that later. On Christmas Eve that year, a young black girl was at a bus stop and she was beaten up by five white men. Snipers were firing at buses, integrated buses, for the next two years, and many churches and houses of pastors in Montgomery were bombed. Here's my point in bringing this up. In the midst of this volatile atmosphere, King formed the organization that he would lead for the rest of his life, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But that organization, and really King's career, was born in a period of great turbulence, violence, the civil rights movement had had war declared on it. It was born out of war. But King wasn't initially responsible for organizing the boycott or even with choosing the path of nonviolence. That had been chosen already for him. You see so often that the movement was not just made by King, he made it, but it also made him. The African-American church had a long tradition of nonviolent protests. King had grown up listening to sermons, like the Sermon on the Mount. Turn your cheek. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. He had studied the philosophy at Morehouse College and at Crozer Theological Seminary, but he wasn't as principled in, <laughs> in adopting nonviolence and, and really a, uh, attached to it as, as he was later on. I mean, King grew up. He had a brother. And he liked to box. I have two little boys now, and I've learned this. Boys, they'll get on the trampoline and just beat the hell out of each other, right? I mean, I can try to stop them. I talk about peace and nonviolence, and they still just get out there and just, you know. King loved to fight when he was a kid. It wasn't natural for him. Maybe it's not natural for anybody to adopt this philosophy. But increasingly, in the years following Montgomery, King realized, you know what? Let's scale this up. It worked in Montgomery. Let's try it all over the place in the South and see if it works. As early as March 1956, King was saying things like, every true Christian is a fighting pacifist. A fighting pacifist, but definitely his views evolved. And it wasn't just the church. He was also looking at texts from uh, the Bhagavad Gita, an ancient Hindu text. He was reading the classic American essay, Civil Disobedience, by Henry David Thoreau, the pragmatist. Uh, he was reading uh, sermons of uh, uh, Henry, uh, Henry Emerson Fosdick, a white liberal New York preacher. And of course, most importantly, Mohandas Gandhi, the leader of a nonviolent revolt against British colonialism in India. And King said, the man who did more than anybody else in human history to show that social problems can be solved 
without resorting to primitive methods of nonviolence, or rather violence, rather. King actually traveled to India in 1959. There he is laying a wreath on his grave. And he became convinced that nonviolent tactics could be used all over the South. But interestingly, guys that are studying Letter from Birmingham Jail, let me ask you this. Why isn't Gandhi mentioned once, not even alluded to, in that letter? You know, I had a chance to go a couple years ago to Morehouse College to the King Personal Archives. It's literally a vault, like a bank vault, where all of his private papers and books are kept. Or many of them, not all of them. So I started looking at the books that King owned that were written by Gandhi. And you know what's amazing? I realized they hadn't been read. I mean, you know when a book has been read. It looks like it's been, you know, bent up and there's markings in it. King loved to write in his books. None of the books that he owned by Gandhi had been read. No, instead, the book, The Power of Nonviolence by an American Disciple of Gandhi, which Greg, and also some of Fosdick's sermons, and Fosdick had been reading Gandhi. So King gets Gandhi through sort of a filter of other authors. So what does this tell you about King? He's a syncretist. He brings together all of these various strands, Christian, Hindu, pragmatist thought. And sometimes this poses a problem for King's Christian followers, right? They're like, what's this minister, Baptist preacher doing, reading some Hindu text or following some guy from India? Didn't pose a problem for King, though. In fact, King said, look, there's a long lineage of nonviolence, including in the church. And he said, in no way diminishes my belief in Jesus. He said, Christ furnished the motivation and the spirit of nonviolence, but Gandhi furnished the method. He wasn't just a matter of principle, though. It was also a matter of practical reality. King said, a second civil war, if we fought one, would be very bloody and black people would lose. You know why? Because they didn't have the weapons. They would be fighting against the American military. Who controlled that military? White people. And they had a lot bigger guns. But also, King believed that God had led him to bring people to peace and reconciliation. His favorite phrase, the beloved community. This was his calling in life, he thought. And he believed that sometimes violence, yes, it was necessary. What do you do with Hitler, for instance? People would always ask, you know, what if somebody attacks you personally? But most of the time, he said, love is the answer to social problems. And he also said that modern weapons of war, like nuclear weapons or machine guns, rule out the possibility of violence ever again being a way to really solve problems. They uh, rule out the possibility of war ever serving as a negative good. Listen to me, guys. This is the most important thing I'll tell you today. For King, integration was not merely some political goal, some tactic. It was the heart of everything he believed. He said life at its best is a creative synthesis that brings together opposites in the fruitful harmony. In his book uh, on the Montgomery story, Strike Towards Freedom, he underlines the six principles of nonviolence, which emphasize courage, understanding, love, and the belief in the ultimate meaning of suffering. At one point, King said, I'm married to nonviolence. I'm never giving up on it. Sometimes he was tempted, as we'll talk about in a moment. He was always pointed, keen to point out that nonviolence is not the same thing as non-resistance. For him, nonviolence is not just taking it, but it's about doing things. It's about being active, protesting, fighting just without violence. Letter from Birmingham Jail, he says, nonviolence creates tension, or at least it reveals the tension that's already in communities, among communities that don't face up to the violence and to the struggles in, in, in inside the community. Originally, King actually thought of um, like trying to persuade police officers and Ku Klux Klan members with nonviolence. Later on, he realized it really doesn't work all that well. If they're so committed to racism, you know, it's just kind of hard to, to reason with a, a person who is so deeply entrenched in it. So instead, what he learned to do is work with white moderates, with people with good hearts and people that didn't like segregation, but they hadn't yet been radicalized. They hadn't yet been drawn into the struggle. And King sought to shame people, to provoke them, and then to inspire them, good people, to speak up, to stand up in their communities against the evil that had been lurking there for so long. He would often lead workshops where they would try to like, practice being beaten up. Have you guys ever had a chance to restrain yourself from being violent? 
like somebody is being violent or threatening violence towards you, and you have to stop yourself. I'm reminded of when my uh, son had two boys, and when they were toddlers and they were nursing, and they're just coming out of nursing, you know, you put them on, like mom would nurse them, and then my wife would hand them to me, and I'd birth them, and I'd put them against it. Well, they started to develop these little tiny but razor sharp teeth. And so if you're parents, you may know this experience. I would burp Will. This is my kids, my oldest son, Will. I'm burping him. All of a sudden, he would think he's nursing again, and he would latch on with those teeth right here. Hey, guys, I love my son. Let me preface, I love my son. But when he bit right there, I wanted to chuck that baby as far away from me as I was like, oh, get the hell off me, right? Because it hurt. How, therefore, could someone not react with violence to the physical pain caused by a stranger or someone that hates you? Well, King's organization not only educated protesters about the techniques, but also about civil disobedience, about breaking unjust laws. But they also attempted to prepare people for the just absolute brutality they would face in the streets. And nonviolent protesters took solemn oaths swearing that they would remain nonviolent if they were attacked or insulted. <laughs> As you're about to see, it's a difficult sell. Not only to the students, but also to those in positions of leadership and influence in the African American community. The ironic thing is, at the end, who do they arrest? The black guy. <laughs> One such skeptic was the great Dr. Kenneth Clark. Eminent psychologist played an instrumental role in his testimony before the Supreme Court and the University Board of Education. Dr. Clark shared King's goals, but he thought nonviolence was psychologically burdensome, which was a point Malcolm X picked up on, as he argued that his solution of manly resistance to uh, racism was more realistic and he would use any means necessary to solve the problem. King's nonviolent philosophy contained streaks of secular, non-orthodox thought, but ultimately it really did rely upon a belief, not necessarily just in God, but in a, belief, in a belief in the spiritual reality that guaranteed the value of suffering. Even if nonviolence proved effective in the short term, even if it didn't change anybody's minds, you had to hold on to the belief that, as Theodore Parker once said, and King quoted this often, the arc of the moral universe is, don't know this quote, it's long, it's long, but it bends toward justice. In other words, if not necessarily grounded in Christian faith, at least it was grounded in the belief that the universe somehow was on your side. James Baldwin said later on, the reason why nonviolence didn't pick up as much in the North as it did in the South is because a lot of black people stopped going to church. Not only that, nonviolence requires massive participation. Gandhi's maxim was fill up the jails. And if you don't have a lot of people on your side, nonviolence really doesn't work. You need a lot of folks to join in. And as we've already observed, you see those images on television, and you think, do I really want to do that? And yet they did. Students came from all over this country. And for seven years, the civil rights movement kind of plugged along, occasionally having great victories, mainly due to student-led protests like the Freedom Riders, but mostly defeats. Let me rush on by saying by 1963, things were pretty rough for Dr. King, and it was, there was no guarantee that he was going to succeed in finally ridding this country of Jim Crow segregation. All the while, King and his family are under constant threat. Here's a photograph of a bullet hole in his daughter's bedroom. This photograph is on my wall in my office. That's a picture of King pulling out a burnt cross from his front yard with his son. That's Martin III there. His home was bombed twice. He received death threats on a nightly basis. He was stabbed at a book signing in 1958. The pen knife came within inches of severing his aorta artery, which it later was reported that if he had had the knife in him and it just happened to sneeze, he would have died instantly. We came that close to losing him. He was under constant pressure as the figurehead of a great movement that represented millions of people. And even though um, by 1960, when John Kennedy was elected, it kind of looked like things were in the upswing still, it was clear that the nation, that Congress, would have to be prodded 
into action by demonstrations and by arrest. And King was not the kind of man that would just say, well, you know, uh, you guys go to jail. I'm just going to sit over here on the sidelines. No, he went to jail 30 times in his life. Here he is in his Montgomery days being arrested. By the way, hey, Dr. Fix wearing his jacket just like that. That's a sweet jacket, right? That salt and pepper look. Nice looking there. Dr. King was a handsome man and and charismatic. And, and that jail picture actually circulated around the country. Here he is being arrested in 1958. Uh, this is in uh, Montgomery. He's motioning off to the side to Coretta, his wife, saying, it's okay. Go call my lawyer. This guy freaks me the hell out. I don't know, man. Here he is in 1964 being arrested in St. Augustine, Florida. This was the same city where a motel manager, all these protesters were showing up, all these students, and they were wanting to stay at the motels. And this motel manager there was so upset, and he didn't want them staying there, that he put hydrochloric acid in the pool. And then later on, an alligator. <laughs> a freaking alligator in the pool to keep them from staying there. King spent many nights of his life in his car because no motel would register him. Let me roll on by saying, by 1963, King needed a victory. The previous year in Albany, <laughs> Georgia, his efforts, which he had worked so hard on, had failed miserably. It's hard to think of Martin Luther King as a failure, but sometimes he did. And so that was partly because he didn't really have a focus in his protest. Birmingham, Alabama provided him with an opportunity to try out kind of a new strategy. It was still nonviolence, but he was really going to focus on one thing, economic discrimination, specifically clothing stores, department stores. So he shows up really at the invitation, this is a point he makes in the letter from Birmingham jail, at the invitation of this fiery, brash, uh, they called him a cussing minister. His name was Fred Shuttlesworth. Shuttlesworth then invited him, had already been involved in some voting rights protests in Birmingham. So they show up in spring of 1963, and part of it was because they had been invited. Another reason, though, they come to Alabama, though, to Birmingham, is because of this dude. Oh, sorry, there's one of the uh, restaurants, uh, the signs outside uh, denying them access. Also, uh, department stores. Um, in spring, a lot of people like to buy new clothes for Easter, right? Buy a new suit, buy a new dress. And department stores were segregated as well. And so King thought, this is where we could really focus our efforts as Easter is coming. But they also came to Birmingham because of Bull Connor, a jackass, uh, who also was <laughs> the commissioner of public safety. He was an autocrat. And he believed in using any means necessary to quash civil rights movements and protests. John Kennedy once said that if not for Bull Connor, you don't have I Have a Dream, you don't have the Nobel Peace. Well, he didn't say that. He said, you don't have the civil rights movement. It really, the success is in Birmingham if not for this guy. And he was stubborn in his resistance to protest movements, but not the only one. By April, several protesters had already gone to jail. They already had a bunch of folks in jail, and King and 50 others were planning on being arrested on Good Friday, April 12th, 1963. Now, King had been arrested several times, like we talked about, but what King didn't count on, what he, he wasn't afraid of being arrested. He was afraid of disobeying the courts. The courts were often the only friends King ever had, right? Brown versus Board, the, the court injunction that freed him in Montgomery. They were his only friends in government. But then, the week before, a court order had been issued, an injunction prohibiting him from protesting. And if he disobeyed that order, he wouldn't just go to jail for a couple days. He might go for months, years, because he was in contempt of court. But King decided to go forward with it anyway until one more thing happened, and it shook him to his absolute core. The bail bondsman, the one friendly bondsman in Birmingham, was planning on bailing King and his friends out. The city came to him the night before the march and said, you can't bail them out. You don't have any money. Sorry. It was a scare tactic, and it scared King. What were they going to do? They were out of money and time. And for that, may I read to you a portion from King's book, Why We Can't Wait. He said, good Friday morning, early, I sat in room 30 of the Gaston Motel, discussing this crisis with 24 of our key people. And as I looked around, I saw I sensed a sense of doom in that room. I looked about me and I saw that for the first time, our most devoted and dedicated followers were overwhelmed with a feeling of hopelessness. No one knew what to say and no one knew what to do. And finally, someone spoke up. And by the way, he doesn't say this. I think it's his dad. His dad was there. 
Imagine again being a father. He said whatever was on everyone's mind. He said, Martin, you can't go to jail. We need money. We need a lot of money. And you have the contacts in New York and Hollywood to go get us money to bail us out. You're the only one. If you go to jail, though, we're lost. The Battle of Birmingham is lost. I sat there conscious of 24 pairs of eyes. I thought about the people in jail. I thought about the Birmingham Negroes already lining the streets of the city, waiting to see me put into practice what I had so passionately preached. How could my failure to submit to arrest be explained to the local community? What would be the verdict of the country about someone who pressured and, and urged all these people to make this stunning sacrifice, and then all of a sudden went, oh, oh I'm out. But then my mind raced in the opposite direction. Suppose I did go to jail. What would happen to the 300? Who would be willing to follow us, knowing, not knowing whether they would ever once again be able to walk out into the Birmingham sunshine? There was no guarantee that you go to jail. There's no guarantee you get out alive. I sat in the midst of the deepest quiet I've ever felt. And there were two dozen others in the room. There comes a time in the atmosphere of leadership when a man surrounded by loyal friends and allies realizes that he has come face to face with himself. I was alone in a crowded room. I walked to another room in the back of the suite. I stood in the center of the floor. I think I was standing at the center of all that my life had come to be. I thought of the 24 people waiting in the next room. I thought of the 300 waiting in jail. I thought of the Birmingham community waiting. But then my mind leapt beyond city and state lines past the jail, and I thought of 20 million black people who dreamed that someday there they might cross the Red Sea of Injustice and find their way to the promised land of integration and freedom. Well, there was no more room for doubt. I pulled off my shirt and my pants, got into work clothes. They were dingy clothes. They wore dingy clothes as protests for the department stores that wouldn't sell the clothes. And I went to the other room and I decided to tell him I'm going to jail. He said, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where the money's going to come from. But I have to make a faith act. Then he turns to Ralph, his best friend, fellow pastor, and he says, Ralph, I know you want to be in your pulpit on Sunday morning, Easter but I want you to come with me. He says, Ralph stood up with everybody else without hesitation. And 25 voices in room 30 of the Gaston Motel in Birmingham, Alabama, joined hands and chanted the battle hymn of their movement. We shall overcome. <laughs> From there. Whew. King marched. City Hall. Hundreds of people lining the streets. Most were cheering them. Some were not. Some were throwing beer bottles at them. Now, they're about to approach a police barricade. When they arrive at the barricade, they're going to be told to disperse or be arrested. And King and Abernathy paired up, wearing the dingy work clothes that symbolized the discrimination that they faced in Birmingham Department clothing stores. They come up to this police officer. He tells them to stop. And quietly and simultaneously, rather than dispersing, they sink to their knees. The police officer then grabs them by their belts. as if they were children. He yanks them up and hauls them into a paddy wagon. But then two more, a white man and a black man, come and they sink to their knees. And then they're arrested. And then two more, and so on, and so on, until all 50 are arrested. King was booked and thrown into solitary confinement at the city jail. He was put in a place named The Hole. For the next 24 hours, he was not given the right to talk to anybody, his attorneys. He was not given the right to call his wife, Coretta, who was at home with a newborn child. She was terrified. By the way, this, this picture hangs up in my office. It's right across from my desk. And I always feel like Dr. King is looking at me, <coughs> saying, what are you doing, Clark? Get off YouTube. Get to work. You've got things to do. 
Terrify, uh, Coretta King, oops, I better plug this in, she decided, you know what, I, I need to go get some help. And so she calls the White House. <laughs> And she talks to President Kennedy, and President Kennedy calls his brother, the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, and basically they threaten him. They say, you better get Martin Luther King's freaking phone call, or we're going to call in the National Guard. Well, they do. Shortly thereafter, King gets at least a chance to see Ralph. And on Easter Sunday afternoon, after what he called the eight most bewildering and frustrating hours of eight days of my life, he was informed that a famous senior, Harry Golfonte, had raised $50,000 for his bail and promised to get everybody else out. And after eight days in jail, King was released. In the meantime, favorite part of the story today. He was denied a writing pad as well. He's in jail with Ralph. They won't give him any writing pads. And so he discovers instead, thanks to a friendly trustee at the jail, a newspaper which contains a statement by eight Alabama clergymen. These are no hit country pastors, okay? I, and I grew up in a hit country <laughs> church, so I can say that. This, this, these are powerful folks in the church. They are the Alabama's Catholic, Episcopal, and Methodist bishops. The state's Presbyterian moderator, a prominent rabbi, important note there, and the First Baptist Church pastor in Birmingham. These are powerful dudes. And their statement, which was titled, A Call to Unity, condemns King's actions in Birmingham. The statement appeared above a news item of a, um, of a woman in Birmingham who believed in the true meaning of Easter. And so she housed an Easter egg party for Negro children in Birmingham. In the margins of the paper, King begins to reply. And then when he runs out of space in the newspaper, and unfortunately the newspaper's lost, we don't have the actual copy of this, but he runs out of space and he still doesn't have a legal pad. So you know where he goes? My favorite part. They give him some toilet paper and he continues writing on the toilet paper. And then they smuggle out these drafts on toilet paper through his lawyer secretly to Wyatt Walker on the other side of town who begins typing up what eventually becomes the first draft of Letter from Birmingham Jail. This is the second draft that we're looking at here. That's King's handwriting. It was a manifesto he'd been waiting his whole life to give. Writing in the tradition of the Apostle Paul and other early Christians from jail. He never intended to keep it private. This was a public letter from the very beginning. And a few weeks after he got out of jail, it was published in the Christian, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, where is it? American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, published it first. And then Christian Century couple of months later, and then it ended up kind of getting spilled out into all these various periodicals before he finally published the entirety of it in its final form in this book. Why we can't wait. After King got thrown in jail, you know what happened? Birmingham caught fire. Several other protests occurred, including the Children's Crusade, organized by King's <laughs> Lieutenant James Bevel. Almost a thousand children are arrested, some of them as young as six years old. Hundreds of college and high school students show up, not just from Birmingham, but from around the country in support of the movement, and they flood the jails. But when they arrived in Birmingham, they encountered hell. Fire hoses were powerful enough to tear the clothes off your back baton-wielding racist policemen, vicious police dogs. Folks, these are some of the most important images in American history. They literally changed our country. And horrific and revolting as they are, they're exactly what King hoped for. Remember, it wasn't about creating violence, King said. It was about revealing it, taking what was in the dark and putting it in front of the light, putting it in front of the lights of cameras to let them see, to let America, to let the world see this. The movement's goal, as he says in I Have Dream, was to dramatize a shameful condition and bring the violence and oppression of African Americans out into the open. Having fulfilled King's Gandhian vision, 
and bringing international <laughs> media attention to Birmingham, finally Birmingham relents. And they start desegregating their restaurants and their clothing stores, and they even set up an agreement to monitor it going on in the future. It was a great victory. And you know what immediately happened after that? The Ku Klux Klan bombed the Gaston Motel. That's King Bedroom. Luckily, he wasn't there. He escaped by the skin of his teeth again. The next night, they bombed King's brother's house. In September of that year, the Ku Klux Klan, this is a month after I have a dream. The Ku Klux Klan throws dynamite into a basement in 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. There were four little girls inside practicing for a church play. They were murdered. King preached the eulogy at their funeral. How do you think he felt about that? Birmingham was one step. It was not the end of the civil rights movement. It was a great victory, no doubt. But there were many more steps to take. There are many more steps to take before this movement comes to a conclusion. Let me rush on really quick because we're almost out of time and I'm going to leave a few minutes for questions. Let me just say, a lot of my research deals with the final five years of King's life. After I had a dream in 1963, and then he wins the Nobel Peace Prize in 64, and the Civil Rights Act is, pa is passed in 1964, the most important piece of legislation it passed in the 20th century, along with the 19th Amendment. Incredible doings. Segregation is outlawed in law, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. These are great victories. And then King loses basically all of his support. For two reasons. One, he started to fight for the rights of poor people, and boy, that'll get you killed in this country. He started to fight for the rights of poor people, black and white, and he started to wonder, why is it that poor black men are being sent over at a higher rate to fight in Vietnam? And by the way, they're going over there to kill people of color as well. How's that? Why is it that we spend billions and billions of dollars for war and not a penny for the poor, King asked. And all of his friends, all his friends in the media, President Johnson, who was a friend, not anymore. They all deserted him. By 1968, King was <laughs> at the end of his rope. Oh, by the way, a, a couple other reasons why he lost support. Malcolm X, who himself was a valiant civil rights activist and was murdered <laughs> in 1965, but also drew away a lot of people once people got frustrated and fed up with how nonviolence wasn't really bringing the promised rewards. King moved his family in Chicago in 1966 and saw more hatred and violence, according to his own words, saw more hatred in the eyes of whites than in any other place in the whole country. That's him marching on the west side of Chicago, and he got hit in the head with a brick. Nazis, actual neo-Nazis, were attacking him. It was a hard last four or five years of his life. But he planned, nevertheless, to go back to Washington, he called it the Poor People's Campaign. He was going to bring committed protesters to Washington, D.C. to fight for the rights of poor people, including black people. But before he did, he made one stop. His final act on this earth was fighting for the rights of garbage workers. My favorite Martin Luther King fact, garbage workers in Memphis, Tennessee. And while he was there on April 3rd, 1968, he gave his best speech. It's a speech that he had no notes for. He was running <laughs> 101 fever at the time. He had no notes for it. And yet he gave the best speech of his life in which he said, I may not get there with you. He had had a bomb threat on his plane the night before. He was always kind of concerned about death, but especially at the end of his life. He almost became morbid about it. He said, I may not get there with you, but I'm not concerned about that now. All I want to do is God's will, and God has led me up to the mountain. Like Moses, I've looked over, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. He says, I want you to know we as a people will get there to the promised land. And so he says, I'm not worried about anything. I don't fear any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The following night, a convicted uh, felon, racist, James Earl Ray, pops a bullet into his neck at the Lorraine Motel and killing him instantly. He knew. King knew his time was up. I swear he did. And it would be up to the rest of us who followed him to create the beloved community. And folks, can I just say as we conclude, we are their legacy. Better or worse, sometimes beloved, sometimes not. Sometimes still separated by prejudice and ignorance and hatred. There's no denying the fact, in my mind at least, that this room 
this group, this collection from all racial, ethnic, sexual, religious, and cultural backgrounds, none of us would be here if not for the work of student protesters like John Lewis and Julian Bond, or of community organizers like Rosa Parks and the great Diane Nash. Read about her. She's amazing. Prophets like Jim Bevel and Bob Moses. Elderly grandmothers like Mother Pollard, Septima Clark. Courageous young men like, like James Meredith and Emmett Till. Fiery orators like Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer. Oh my God, read about family and Fannie Lou Hamer. She's an amazing activist. Brilliant authors like James Baldwin and Martin Luther King. Look, he's not a saint. He wasn't a perfect man. He wasn't the only man. But he was a good man, nevertheless. And he is a man worth honoring. How do we honor him? We honor him by hewing out of the mountains of despair, and God knows they get bigger every day. We hew out of those mountains of despair, stones of hope. We take our country back once again to the great wells of democracy, which were dug deep. We use light to put out darkness. We put on our work clothes. We make a faith act. And we fearlessly march towards the promised land of freedom and justice. I'd like to conclude this morning with um, a poem, an adaptation of Langston Hughes's poem honoring Frederick Douglass. I've changed a few words here and there to focus on Dr. King, but for the most part, this poem remains as it was, which is a testament not only to Hughes's poetic gifts, but also to that common yet glittering ore that you find in all great leaders. And so here's my adaptation. Martin Luther King, after Langston Hughes's, Frederick Douglass, 1817-1895. Martin was someone who, had he walked with weary foot and frightened tread, might be, from very indecision, might be dead. Huh. Might have lost his soul. But instead, decided to be bold and capture every street on which he set his feet. To route each path towards freedom's goal. To make each highway choose his compass's choice. To all the world, he said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Man can't ride your back unless it's bent, he said. He died in 1968. He is not dead. He's not dead. Okay, thank you for coming today. Uh, let's uh, let's take a few moments then for uh, some questions, and, and please feel free to ask anything you'd like about um, Dr. King, about civil rights movements, or uh, well, anything else really uh, that that I can help you with. And, and certainly, we also have uh, Dr. Fick here who I think is probably just as much, if not more, of an expert on civil rights than I am. The man actually met Dr. King once. That's pretty good. Now, how old were you, Dr. Fick? Were you three? Uh, I lived in, well, I, my parents were in that picture there way back. But that was a little too dangerous to that. take us to the little. Yeah. So they did take us to Washington for that. You know. that, that. That was the march so, to... Um, Montgomery. Involved in, in, because they were competing in Kansas in the bottom of the school principal in Topeka. So ask him questions too. <laughs> it's awesome. He's probably the only person here old enough to yeah. remember any of this. But you probably know far more than this. this is your deal. Well, let's let's hear some questions. Come on. Anything at all? When did he publish Why We Can't Wait? Good question. He published it in 1964. That was a um, a year after the Birmingham campaign, he published it with the help of a couple of uh, really co-authors that aren't in the book. It was, it was ghostwritten in a lot of ways by a couple of folks because he was so busy. It was also the year that he was advocating for the Civil Rights Move, uh, Act, and also he won the Nobel Prize that year. So King was incredibly busy, and yet still I think this book, uh, despite the fact that it had some other folks' hand in it, as did I Have a Dream. I Have a Dream was written with several other folks as well. But at the end of the day, this is King's, I think it's his greatest book. And it is the book that most succinctly um, summarizes his view of the importance and the value of nonviolent direct action. 
Yeah. Dr. Pick? You mentioned that the whole question of the passive assist and book thing mm -hmm. uh, regarding self defense. Yes, sir. And we asked the question what about FIBRA? Yeah. Um, are you, do you know whether or not um, Ping was reading Dietrich von Yes. Um, first thing I'll say about that is we often think of authors and public figures and folks like King as having the same views on the world and having the same philosophy their entire lives. That's not true. Guys, I was reading a paper um, I wrote as a freshman in college a couple years ago. It was a paper on the Supreme Court. And I kept it. I don't know why. But I was reading it, and I've been 18 years old, like many of you might be in this room, when I wrote that paper. And I realized something as I read it. I disagree with everything I thought. Like I had completely done a one on that issue. And you know why? Because I was writing my dad's paper. If I hadn't yet developed my own politics, my own view of the world, I was still my dad's kid. And I love my dad. But at the end of the day, I hadn't yet developed my own ideas. Authors changed their minds. Bonhoeffer started off as a pacifist. Later on, he ended up getting involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler, although he wasn't necessarily turning his back on pacifism. There's a book called Bonhoeffer and King that was released a few years ago. It's worth a read. Um, anyway, he had read Bonhoeffer. I don't think he had read a whole lot of him. He had read The Cost of Discipleship. That's part of what I'm writing a book right now about uh, King and uh, Christian pacifism. That's one of the areas that I researched. He had read him. Uh, he knew about him, but he mainly knew about Bonhoeffer through Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who was another Christian theolo uh, theology, uh, uh, famous theologist at the time. Um, King was well connected with Christian the uh, theology uh, folks like Paul Tillich uh, and others in the... Uh, in America, to a lesser extent in Europe, but he had read Bonhoeffer. Yeah, so he knew uh, some of the arguments against pacifism. He knew that uh, some people would often bring up Hitler, and it's kind of interesting to consider. In Letter from Birmingham Jail, he often refers to not only, not just his Hitler, but the plight of the Jews. Why? I think partly, though not totally. I think it's partly because don't forget, one of his clergymen he was writing to was a rabbi. He says, had I, had I been in Nazi Germany during World War II, I would have stood up for my Jewish brothers. Why does he include that? I think part of it is he's thinking about his audience, and he's hoping to persuade them. But more than that, King was often uh, involved. He was with Ra uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel. He was involved with Jews across this country uh, and trying to get them involved in civil rights protests as well. As you might know, African Americans and Jews in this country sometimes have a fractious relationship, and um, King was trying to heal some of that. But anyway, it's very interesting to consider why King alludes to Israel, to Hitler, and to the Holocaust in a letter from Birmingham Jail. Somebody else? Another question. We have a question online. Oh, great. Thank you, Nikki. What's Dr. King's stance on civil disobedience? What was the main point that Dr. King tried to convey in these letters from Birmingham Jail? Yes, he spends quite a bit of time making a legal argument in this text, saying there are four different ways that you can identify an unjust law. One of them being, of course, is it, is it rooted in eternal law, what lots of you call the Tao, um, which is, you know, <laughs> do you need somebody to tell you that murder is wrong? No, you can just look inside yourself for that, right? Can you, do you need somebody to tell you that theft is wrong? No, there's just, you can just observe it. Um, but more than that, King also was looking at minority-majority law uh, problems. And to be honest, uh, King's philosophy of civil disobedience as I said, he was bringing a lot of different texts and allusions and, and um, views on that, but it's probably the most criticized part of Letter from Birmingham Jail by um, scholars of the law, by philosophers. Um, certainly, I think you, I mean, you know, what's to stop somebody from saying, you know, well, my conscience tells me that, um, that theft is not, you know, um, is not something that's wrong, so I'm just going to do it. Well, but King would probably say, well, there's other things you need to look at for determining whether you can actually break a law. But to answer your question, let me just say this. King's philosophy is you lovingly break the law. You don't break the law because he's not an anarchist. Because you don't break the law because you just don't like it. I mean, you know, do I, I don't like the speed limit on 191. I drove behind somebody this morning who's going 55 in the left lane. God help me, I want to just drive him off the road. But I did because I'm a pastor. But I wanted to. But what's stopping me? Part of it is because I respect that law. Part of it is I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you break a, an unjust law, not because you want to just break laws, but because you love the law. And because you realize that order is important in a society. And when those unjust laws are so are, are dehumanizing, when they, when they violate 
natural laws and basic human rights, then you have no choice. King did not believe you negotiated on human rights. You stand up for them every single time, even if that means breaking the law. He would often use Old Testament and New Testament examples, as well as secular examples, Boston Tea Party, interesting example for him to bring up, or um, um, Socrates, as well as the Old Testament, Sirach, Meshach, and Abednego, the early, you know, the first century Christians who broke laws. But you break them lovingly. That's the answer. You break it because you have the highest respect for the law, not just because you don't like laws. No, it's, 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 it's on a more elevated plane than that. Yes, sir? What's your best guess on the following? If King, if King were alive today, uh, what would his views on building a wall on our border be? Okay. If King were alive today, he would be 80, no, yes, he would be 90 years old. Am I doing the math right? 1929 to 2019? Yeah, 90 years old. <laughs> um, it's always very difficult to imagine an author being transported into a DeLorean, you know, and going to the future. I, I love the question. I'll, I'll answer it, but I'll just preface it by saying we don't really know because authors, and all of us, uh, we form ideas, we form arguments, we form philosophy based on our, our cultural constraints and the times we live in, right, the context. Um, all that said... I think King would probably be very sympathetic to those who would argue about the, um, the ways in which trade laws in the past 20 years or so, 30 years, have wrecked inner cities, and, uh, and, and not just inner cities, but also across uh, the Rust Belt to the north. I think he would be sympathetic to those views. I think he cared about poor people, and he cared about all people, uh, not just his own. All that said... I can't imagine him thinking of, of, of a border wall as doing anything except exacerbating already existing racial tensions. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of uh, folks in the last couple of weeks talk about the wall as being a monument to racism. I think King King would probably be, um, I think he would probably agree with that, probably. And I think probably King would be involved at some level in protesting against it. Um, yeah. So I, I think he would be, he would not favor it, but I don't want to go so far as, he, as to say that he would not respect the other side's point of view on the ways in which immigration has affected our economy. All that said, no, I can't imagine him being in favor, but I just can't. Um, I think he would also be very concerned about the ways in which the military is currently being used either as a threat to build the wall or to regulate and police the border. I think he would be really concerned about that. One of, he called the three evils of American life um, uh, greed and um, racism and militarism. And I think the militarizing of our, of our, of our, of our military, of, of, of this country, I think would greatly concern him even more. Like the reaction to it maybe would make him even more worried than just the fact that somebody wants to build a wall. That's what I think. I have no idea. It's a total guess. Speculation, because he's not here, unfortunately. And I often think about that in other ways, too. What would you think about Barack Obama being elected president? What would you think about gay rights? There were uh, gay men and women who worked on his staff, who helped him form I Had a Dream, Bayard Rustin among them, the most prominent of them. Um, what would you think about uh, the Me Too movement? What would you think about Black Lives Matter? All well, these things always swirling in my mind. It's hard to know for sure, but it's a fun part of the game. <laughs> and definitely something we do need to be thinking about. We need to think about, like King did, how these previous decades, the protests that came before us, they laid the groundwork. Like I said, <coughs> we are their legacy, and we're continuing the work that they started. He didn't invent it. He was just continuing in the line that was before him, and we continue in his legacy as well. Any other questions? Guys, thank you so much. I'll stick around. I'll go to my office. You can hang around and talk to me if you'd like. Appreciate you being here. Enjoy your time. Thank you, Dr. Rougeau, for helping with that.